question. So my name's Mike Thompson. I'm the, uh, one of the principal architects in the office of the CTO. And I actually uh, have the nickname uh, the janitor. It's like I, I cover all sorts of different products, all different disciplines. Um, and it's one of those opportunities where I've been dealing with ADC technology back when it was really load balancing, like local director, even some of the old legacy spring tide stuff and some other, some other items. But to answer your question, uh, we're not going to get into like the CGN portion because we were kind of hoping to focus more on the enterprise space. And the enterprise, they're kind of insulated right now from a lot of the IPv6 problems, right? Unless you're dealing with like government or something that requires you to actually move to IPv6. You know, which is a shame in a lot of contexts, uh, but at the same time, it's like, you know, I, I don't think we have necessarily exhaustion problem as much as an allocation problem. Uh, you have a lot of universities that still have massive, you know, you know slash eights out there and stuff. Uh, but one thing that I think is an interesting topic is, and maybe we can talk a little bit offline, is yeah. specifically what you see out there. And, uh, yeah, I've, just seen, I've seen it a few slides, so I was just curious if you are going to touch on it, but that's okay. Yeah, so one thing, uh, we, we are just right off the bat, right, we're, we're a dual stack platform. We don't charge any licensings for our platform. And I'm unfortunately going to sound like a marketing guy for a few minutes. Sorry, guys, over there. Uh, you know, <coughs> but I just want to kind of make you aware that we don't have any licensing. And when you actually start thinking about it, I'm going to kind of start from the network level and, and work our way up. And part of this has to do with, I'm going to tell a story of a day in the life of an operator. But from a networking perspective, right, Either you have load balancing today in your existing infrastructure that's you know up to date modern, either you have something that is um, you know way legacy which you know may have been put into the infrastructure in a certain way, or you actually it's all greenfield so you have design options. And so one of the core aspects of uh, our deployment modes with our platforms are you know we have a routed node where we act like a uh, again an L3 gateway, we have a one arm configuration mode where we use source uh, network address relation to basically pop into the infrastructure. So in essence, uh, we act as a uh, client for requests of the server. This way we don't get any asymmetry. We are a full proxy architecture, and as a result, we don't want to screw up TCP uh, when we start actually communicating. And then we have the transparent mode, which is really designed for legacy environments where some people back in the day thought it was really good to do L2 for ADC services. Not very good architecture in my opinion, but DSR mode is definitely something where like when you start trying to scale out things in the cloud, especially let's say on AWS, it may make sense because of bandwidth limitations within uh, AWS to maybe use DSR, right, to, to scale out certain things. So it's actually uh, one of the use cases that I've been playing around with where how do you get all these complex services to be able to still speak at scale out to the public internet without being bottlenecked through an ADC? And this actually is a, is a good solution. So what we're going to do, unfortunately, we ran over a little bit in our last segment, and we we're going to show a couple demos. So I'm going to have to kind of briefly go through some things, and we might have to uh, accelerate because we, are, we do have a hard stop. Uh, but I want to tell you the life and the story of a data center operator that involves, you know, one, a traditional data center where it's really focused, to your point, on virtualization and maybe even, like, physical uh, servers. And then we have, uh, you know, physical hardware in the data center. To where people are moving to cloud, and I know you guys probably heard OpenStack like 90 times this week already, but the reality is is that for us it's just easy to spin up and kind of be just done with it. So, uh, you know, we don't care about the cloud. We're not selling that. We're selling enablement of the cloud, right? So when we start looking at, uh, you know, the environments from an application perspective, and by the way, I'm an app developer, right? That's what I, I focus a lot of my time on. To me, the network doesn't matter. I just want, I just need transport. I just need something to get you know, my messages across to my client. And when I start looking at the application environment, one thing that I don't have today is collaboration with the network. And to me, this is an important point later on down the road if we really start, want to take networking and application development to the next level is truly a collaborative networking environment, application environment, and we'll discuss that a little bit. And then we have our TPS up front where we're going to be attacking, I thought we were doing 120 gigs, that might be a typo, but whatever. Um, Don't steal my thunder, man. And, and basically, yeah. <laughs> and then basically uh, we're going to have our TPS out there showing uh, basically the uh, uh, different attack vector, or per pretending, uh, ah, sorry, let me go ahead and get some water. <laughs> I've been waiting so long I became dehydrated. Um, <laughs> 
So we, uh, so Rich is actually going to talk about and demonstrate the uh, uh, suppression of, of uh, volumetric attack. Now, I hate the word load balancing. All right, this is one of my opinions that people just are like, okay, well, it's load balancing. No, it's not. Load balancing is what I worked with in the late 90s. Okay, load balancing is inherently inside most fabrics today, right? SDN environments. L4 is not very interesting when you start looking at uh, you know, spray and pray technologies. But when you start talking about ADC, you gotta think more of it as a Swiss Army knife. Why? Because to your point earlier, it is kind of a control point in the infrastructure. It is something that's centralized that you actually are extending the application onto the infrastructure to take services. WAF is not load balancing. Authentication offload is not load balancing. Right? And then also, you know, this is kind of one of those sayings. I pulled it off the internet, so WTF marketing, uh, you know, thanks for putting this out there and I put it in the presentation. Um, but one of the interesting things is that as a coder sitting over here doing stuff, right, I have to deal with all sorts of, you know, problems. And if you really think about this, you have zombies literally on the internet coming at you. And think of this as scope creep. I have all these new requirements coming at me. If, if you're a network operator or a dude sitting there saying, hey, I just want to go ahead and, and make sure packets get you know, from, from point A to point B and I have IP reachability and I just want to go home and spend time on the weekend and not think about things except hang out with the family, maybe uh, go do a little hiking or watch the game. You know, you don't want to have to worry about new requirements. And when some dude from upstairs comes down and says, guess what? Uh, I have this thing called PCI that I need you to take care of. Uh, can you go ahead and, and hook us up with some solution? And you do the research, you do that, and you don't realize that you really don't have any way of dealing with stuff like that in your network. So this is when we start talking about uh, scope creep and, and basically all sorts of new um, uh, requirements, you have to have a solution. Routers and switches can't actually solve these problems. ADCs inherently solve these problems. Now, with that said, I totally love the whole zombie thing here, so hopefully it wasn't lost, the scope creep zombies, double entendre thing going on. But uh, I failed as a comedian, that's why I'm an architect. Um, so again, we talked about the software-defined uh, uh, software platform, but one thing that I really want to talk about, I, I really like geeking out on, is our different form factors. Because if you kind of sit there and say, software is important only, or hardware is important only, chances are you're not really being an emotionally honest or intellectually honest engineer. It's one of those things, whatever the business problem requires is actually what you should be focusing on solving, not, not creating a religion around software or hardware. So to me, it's a waste of time. It's not, it's not actual true engineering. What, what tends to happen, I've found, though, is that uh, just different businesses, because of their cultures, will either be hardware focused or software focused. Yeah. You might get a, a well-known hardware company declaring, you know, we are a software company, but they're trying to sell you a box, you know, because that's just the whole way that the mindset works. Yeah. It's, it's really tough to break out of that either way as well, I think. Well, people tend to latch onto the roots, and if you just look at the ADC industry and really just tech in general, we're, we're, in a, we're coming out of a technology arc, which was hardware bigger, faster, right? to you know, herd mentality, distributed architectures, where I can scale out using software. Well, scaling out isn't always free, especially if SSL is involved, uh, and you want to be compliant with your licensing from, from Symantec and all that. But at the end of the day, one of the interesting things about software is it's a hell of a lot more flexible sometimes than hardware. So there is a lot of benefit between both camps, I need high, you know, high density, you know, really fast application performance uh, on one hand. On the other hand, I need low and slow. I don't need a whole lot of stuff. So it just really depends on the requirement. Now, when we start talking about our platforms, we have different form factors. We have our Thunder Appliance, which again, we can carve up into on the high end, uh, you know, 1,024 instances. And think of these as VRFs, different fibs and ribs per instance. So from an L2 perspective, they're, they're segmented all the way up all the way up the stack. So you get a lot of really cool multi-tenant applications with this. So that's, so that's uh, so VRF type functionality, I guess. Um, the multi-tenancy though, um, is that still like, I guess, one management point multi-tenancy? Yes. Or is that like, I can kind of, you can have your virtual instance on there and you can kind of look at your bit and you can look at your it's, bit. It's actually what both. So w within our platform, when you carve it up, 
you have the ability to say, you know, I'm a super user and I have access to everything. I'm going to put this line of business in, in one container, another line of business in another container. From an operating system perspective, though, it's one OS. Right, so if you are trying to get in a true multi-tenant environment to where you need to have complete segmentation, we do that from a data classification perspective, but from a risk management perspective, you might say, well, guess what? I want you on your own box or your own piece of software, however it works out, right? Uh, this is actually used heavily by cloud providers who want to have multi-tenant solutions to where they can basically have high dense, high speed, do offer SSL uh, offloading at, at scale. And I think we have one platform that's doing like 139,000 key exchanges per second, which uh, is, again, the, the heavy RSA operations, which is really the bulk of the lifting, right? What about performance? Do you dedicate performance per tenant, or yeah. can you? Yeah. So you can dedicate how much you know, CPS you want, how much SSL uh, you know, key exchange you want, uh, how many virtual servers, how many you know, uh, real servers are allowed to have you know, tied to, the, to a specific tenant environment. How flexible is that? Can it be adjusted on the fly? Like you can set thresholds that say, okay, they usually get this, but you know, should some trigger something happen, they can adjust quickly? Yeah, so one of the things you can do is when you create a, a partition right, in our platform, these are, you, you create the partition, we go ahead and do some things, but when you go ahead and reapply the, the configuration, uh, it's something that you can actually go and tweak as needed, right? Obviously, if you're at, at you know, 90% capacity and like you're totally, you know, uh, you know you're, you're at the breaking point of a platform doing stuff, you know, you, it may not necessarily be as flexible, you gotta think about it a little bit. But if you're on the low end of the, of the spectrum as far as utilization, yeah, that's, that's not a problem at all. I guess you're thinking you don't wanna be like a, you've carved up your T-cam and yeah, you wanna change that? Sure, you can change that, reload. Right, right. Yeah, 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 no, exactly. we don't have any, okay, <laughs> yeah. Tenants. <laughs> yeah, we don't, we don't have that. You know, and that's actually one of the benefits of our architecture, right, is because we, one of the reasons why reload has to happen for a lot of architectures is because they're using IPC, they have segmented memory, right, for, for you know, each processor, and, and maybe I need something that I need to allocate a little bit more memory for X, Y, and Z. And so having that shared memory architecture actually eliminates a lot of the, uh, a, a lot of the need for, for reloads for a lot of that stuff. So then we have our HVA, our, our Hyper, uh, sorry, our VThunder, which again runs on Hyper-V, KVM, Zen, uh, and ESX. You know, typical, uh, all the majority of the hypervisors. We have our H HVA, appliance, which is we're running, quite frankly, KVM, and we're taking on our hardware, and we're using SRLV to take advantage of the SSL uh, processors, or our cadmiums on board, and then also uh, direct connect to the uh, Ethernet uh, interfaces. Where this is really cool is, let's say you want to go ahead and take, you have like lots of hardware requirements. Um, for, for basically SSL, you, you, have a, you, have, you need hardware SSL, because software just isn't going to cut it. And you, but you need that segmentation, isolation, and flexibility with the APIs to, to do a couple things. This is where this platform ends up uh, working out really well. And then we have our ADPs, which again is user space separation, and then our A cloud architecture. And we have all these services. So.